One of the greatest obstacles to crafting health and wellness is identifying and controlling inflammation. It's at the core of all complex and chronic diseases, and it's the driving mechanism that underlies the most common symptoms that people like you struggle to overcome. Join us as we explore cutting-edge science and research to give you the information and tools you need to create the quality of life you want and deserve. And now, here is the host of Inflammation Nation, Dr. Stephen Noseworthy. Hey there, guys. Welcome back. This is episode 118. It's kind of hard to believe that we've been doing this for just over a year. We're still talking about our functional hierarchy, which is all about understanding uh, which problem to tackle first when you have more than one issue that is creating any loss of quality of life or any chronic symptomatology that you might have. And we've been talking about the second priority which is blood sugar control. Specifically, we're talking about the mechanism of insulin resistance and how that leads into things like metabolic syndrome and ultimately, for some people, type 2 diabetes. And this is part two of that discussion. So last time, I went over the big picture of how insulin resistance is that mechanism. And so these three things are linked, insulin resistance, metabolic syndrome, and then type 2 diabetes. But I want to remind you that you can get insulin resistance and never become a diabetic. But all diabetics start out having insulin resistance first, which then worsens over time, developing metabolic syndrome before they become a type 2 diabetic. So the thing that links them is this continued loss of cellular response to insulin. And I shared how having this high blood sugar, high insulin problem is responsible for all manner of health concerns and complaints. Now, I'm going to zoom into the cellular level again, and we're going to talk about how insulin works at the cell. And then we'll talk about another hormone called glucagon, which, just to give you a sneak peek, opposes the action of insulin and how balance really needs to be maintained between the two if you want to be healthy. It's not just about controlling insulin. It's about having adequate glucagon as well. So let's start with more detail about what insulin does at the cell. And as I mentioned last time, insulin is a hormone. It's produced by the pancreas in response to eating food, but specifically tied to eating carbohydrates. So if you eat protein or fat together or alone, so either protein by itself, fat by itself, or fat and protein together, you're not going to get much of an insulin response, which means that meat and fat-based diets are uniquely suited to helping people with these high blood sugar and insulin-based problems. And that can range anywhere from a low-carbohydrate diet to ketogenic diets to true carnivore, where you don't eat any plant-based foods at all. And as far as food goes, you need to know that different carbohydrates and different amounts of carbohydrates will give you different levels of insulin production. And that's going to vary from person to person. You and I might eat exactly the same meal with the same type and amount of carbohydrates. And my insulin will be produced at one level. Yours will be produced at another. And that's completely geared towards your physiology, what we call your carbohydrate to tolerance or threshold. And there's some genetics thrown in there as well. But to give you an example, carbohydrates that are crunchy and leafy won't raise your insulin nearly as much as starchy carbohydrates like rice, breads, pastas, wheat, other grains, potatoes, and so on, and certainly not as much as pure sugar. So when it comes to the impact on insulin that carbs can have, we can divide carbs into favorable and unfavorable ones. Now, beyond that, everyone has a different carbohydrate tolerance. That's the ability to eat a given amount of sugars and starches and get away with it, for you know, lack of a better way of saying it. And this carbohydrate tolerance is mainly caught up in how well your cells respond to insulin when it's produced. So here's how this works. Let's say that you eat some carbs and your pancreas releases some insulin. If you eat sugary or starchy carbs, you release more insulin than if you ate, for example, just a leafy green salad. They're all carbohydrates, right? So the type of carbohydrate you eat matters, but quantity also matters. <laughs> you can eat a single jelly bean and you won't get the same insulin spike as if you ate the entire bag. I'm not saying go ahead and do that. There's other reasons why you might not want to eat a jelly bean, but a single jelly bean is not going to kill you. So again, if you eat carbs, 
And depending on the type and quantity, you make more or less insulin. Now, the whole point of producing insulin is to help get glucose from your bloodstream into your cells for two main reasons. The first is that your cells can use that glucose to make energy. And the second is to prevent glucose from hanging around too long and causing tissue damage. Because remember that glucose is actually a toxic molecule, so it needs to be either stored or used fairly quickly. The longer it hangs out, the more opportunity it has to cause damage. So the way insulin helps here is by binding to an insulin receptor on the surface of the cell that causes these tiny pores to open up you could use the word door would work exactly the same way, but these tiny, tiny doors or pores open up on the cell surface, which then allows the cell to absorb glucose, taking it from the bloodstream. So you eat, your blood sugar goes up, your pancreas makes insulin, which opens these tiny doorways on the cell membrane and glucose flows from your bloodstream into your cells. And just to let you know, I've greatly simplified this description because the, the intracellular mechanisms that allow this to happen is a, it's a complex multi-step process that involves cell-based signaling systems and translocation of what are called GLUT4 vesicles from the interior of the cell to the cell membrane. And this process can be impaired by any, any number of things, including common problems like inflammation, stress with cortisol elevations, and, and several other things. Now, there's one more thing that insulin does. Yes, it helps glucose go from the bloodstream into the cell, and that's a good thing for the most part. But it also inhibits this other hormone that I mentioned earlier called glucagon, which essentially does the opposite of what insulin does. So whatever insulin does, glucagon does the opposite. Whatever glucagon does, insulin does the opposite and vice versa. So both hormones are produced by the pancreas. They come from the same place, but they come from different types of cells. Insulin comes from what are called the beta cells of the pancreas, whereas glucose comes from another cell type called the alpha cells. And whereas insulin can be considered a storage hormone, for example, taking things from the bloodstream into the cells where they can be used or stored, glucagon takes things out of cells and puts them into the bloodstream. Hence, these are opposing hormones. Now, this part is critical. Because so far we've been talking about blood sugar control, right? So to, to reiterate, insulin takes glucose out of bloodstream, puts it into the cells. Glucagon takes glucose out of your cells and puts it into the bloodstream. And it does so by, and you may have, heard, I know that I've used these words before, but you may have heard words like uh, gluconeogenesis or glycogenolysis. Um, part, of, part of those, one of the hormones that creates that is glucagon and other things can do it as well. So at any given moment, your blood sugar control is very much about the balance between these two hormones, again, both of which come from your pancreas. But glucose isn't the only thing that depends on the balance between insulin and glucagon. Fat does too. So when it comes to fat cells, insulin makes you store body fat and glucagon liberates it. Again, it's storage versus liberation or storage versus release. Now, insulin increases the ability of fat cells to take up both glucose and what are called free fatty acids, that's basically fat in your bloodstream, from your bloodstream, where the fat cells use them to make more body fat. And generally, that's not cool. Obviously, we need some amount of body fat. No one's ever going to have zero body fat. But the average American or North American or person around the world these days, especially industrialized countries, carries way more body fat than people who lived in the same country with the same ethnic background and genetics 30, 40 years ago. So again, glucagon does the opposite. As it relates to fat cells, glucagon helps you break down body fat and release that stored body fat into your bloodstream, where then you can stick it into other cells to use as a fuel source. Let's call it an alternative fuel source, as opposed to glucose, that is. And, and this ability to effectively and efficiently break down body fat or to use fat from your diet as a fuel source instead of or in addition to glucose is what we call metabolic flexibility. And we're going to have a separate episode where we talk about that, and that'll probably be the next one. Now, you might be thinking, well, Doc, it sounds like if I want to have control of my blood sugar and to reduce the chance that I'm going to 
form fat versus burn fat, then what I have to do is I have to shift the balance of these two hormones so that I minimize insulin and I maximize glucagon. And if that's what you're thinking, then you would be correct. And it's not just about fat control. It's not just about your body mass and whether you've got lean muscle or whether you've got excess body fat. There are a whole host of other health benefits that come from controlling insulin and optimizing your glucagon. And, and yes, you're going to have too much glucagon, right? And all of these things are, you know, if you don't have enough, it's bad. If you don't have, or if you have too much, it's bad. And it's kind of a sweet spot in between. Again, pretty much everything is about balance. But here's where this can get really bad. When someone lives their life eating a carbohydrate dominant diet, and they're eating too much for their physiology and too much of the wrong kind of carbs, then the insulin signaling process that allows us to control blood sugar starts to become less efficient. In other words, the more carbs you eat and the more insulin it takes to control that elevated blood sugar from those carbs. And as that process continues to get worse, eventually the insulin receptors start to become resistant to the insulin and it takes more insulin to do the same job. It's a problem of your cells not behaving properly in the face of increasingly high insulin. And this does two things, actually more, but we're just going to focus on two here. First, the more insulin you make, the more resistant your cells become, which means you make more insulin. More insulin means more insulin resistance from the cell, and that means more insulin production in this never-ending spiral. And since your cells don't respond by opening these tiny little doors to clear the glucose, glucose then builds up in your bloodstream, causing high blood sugar, which then becomes topic, toxic and damages your cells and damages your tissues. That's the first thing. The second thing is that with insulin resistance and the increasing, increasingly higher levels of insulin means more inhibition of glucagon. So not only with high insulin, not only do you get the changes at the cellular level and the toxicity of the glucose, you inhibit glucagon, which in appropriate amounts does really good things for you. And one of the things that happens when you inhibit glucagon because your insulin is too high, because you're eating too many carbs of the wrong kind for your physiology, you end up basically in full fat storage mode and you can't break that down and you can't get rid of it. And so your body fat accumulates we could even dive off onto the side conversation. We talked about this several episodes ago, but adipocyte physiology or fat cells and how we can get inflammatory fat cells and we can get fat cells increasing in number or size. These are called phenotypic expressions. And one of those, particularly when we get um, larger fat cells that can store more fat and more toxins, these become inflammatory. It's actually much better to double the number of fat cells you have than to take the fat cells you have and make them twice as large, but the same number. You end up in the same place in terms of your scale weight and maybe your body fat percentage, but one is far more healthy than the other. So this is essentially the underlying mechanism of becoming a diabetic. Remember, you don't technically, you don't become a type two diabetic overnight. By the time you get diagnosed as having type two diabetes, you have probably gone through years of having problems related to beginning with early insulin resistance to more complicated insulin resistance into early phases of metabolic syndrome into more complicated phase of metabolic syndrome. And from that point, it's just a hop, skip and a jump to become a full blown type two diabetic. But the deal is this, this is something I said over and over and over again, is that these are diet and lifestyle related problems. Why, like even though there are genes that predispose you to this problem, these genes are modifiable by changing your diet, changing your lifestyle, dealing better with the environment that you live in. And so again, it's something that's under you con your control. You actually have a choice as to whether or not you are insulin resistant, have metabolic syndrome, or a diabetic. If you have been diagnosed with type 2 diabetes and you don't want to be, you don't have to be but it means you have to do certain things and make certain changes. So let me summarize this episode and we'll talk about what those, some of those changes are in a different episode. 
is I want to give you some practical things, just like we did with the low blood sugar episode where we talked about reactive hypoglycemia. So I want to summarize this episode. Again, we'll meet again to talk about carbohydrate tolerance, metabolic flexibility, and either at the end of that episode or maybe in the next one, we'll talk about practical strategies if you recognize yourself as having this problem. So here's the summary. When you eat carbs, the alpha cells of your pancreas release insulin so that you can go, I'm sorry, the beta cells of your pancreas releases insulin so that you can go into storage mode and get glucose into your cells where you either burn them for fuel or you store it for later use in something called glycogen. The insulin that you make then inhibits any glucagon that you have in your system. And it would be dose dependent. The more insulin you make, the more inhibition of glucagon that you get. And so what ends up happening is the more carbs you eat relative to your carbohydrate tolerance to be defined in, in more detail next episode, especially sugars and starches, the more likely it is that you're not, you're just not going to drop your blood sugar, but you also start making more body fat. And if you're doing this every day, eating too much of the wrong car kinds of carbohydrates for your physiology, then you end up living in a fat forming mode and you shut down your ability to release it. And year after year after year, your physiology becomes more complex, more entangled. I should say your abnormal physiology becomes more complicated and more entangled. And it makes it harder to change. It doesn't mean you can't, but it means that you have to do certain things. So one of the keys to this metabolic health is to control blood sugar and insulin by, number one, knowing your carbohydrate tolerance and staying under that coming next episode and to optimize glucose or glucagon coming next episode. So join us for the next episode of Inflammation Nation. But before I go, can I ask you to show your support for the podcast, making sure that you subscribe, whether you're listening on Apple or Spotify or some other platform, you might be watching these videos on YouTube. That's cool as well. Um, but we want to have people subscribe simply because it moves us up in the ranking and more people can discover the information that you're hopefully pleased to learn. All right, that's a wrap for this episode. Just a reminder that this podcast is an extension of my private practice where I work one-on-one -on -one with people who have chronic health issues. Now, most of my clients have seen many other doctors without much success and, and many, but not all have some form of blood sugar control problem like we've been talking about. But whether you have a simple or a complex case, if your goal is to figure out the root cause of what's going on and you're willing to do what it takes to get better, then maybe we should talk. You can find a contact form on my website, which is drnoseworthy.com. That's drnoseworthy.com. Or you can just simply use the contact information that's in the episode description. All right, guys, we will talk to you at the next episode. See you then.